Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. We have a very exciting talk on a very big uh, science achievement today by Chris Young from Lawrence Livermore Labs and to introduce him. I've asked Mark Capelli from the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering here who was in fact Chris's thesis advisor not long ago to give a personal uh, introduction to him. So Mark. Take it away. Thank you, John. Well, welcome everybody. So my name is Mark Capelli, and uh, as John said, I'm in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Chris. Chris received his bachelor's degree, master's degree, and uh, PhD degree at Stanford. Right? So he's a cardinal all the way. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hear me. Um, uh, his bachelor's degree was in engineering physics, and his master's and PhD was in mechanical engineering. Uh, so his tenure here is close to 10 years. Now, that would be roughly, I guess, 30% of your life at Stanford, or I would say 40% of your memorable life, because the first six years of your life, nobody remembers that anyways. All right. um, so his research uh, in his PhD involved uh, studying the intricacies of uh, plasma accelerators that are now widely used for space propulsion and uh, much of what we learned about how those engines perform it came from some of his research. Um, now he's a target designer in the Inertial Confinement Fusion uh, Program and the High Energy Density Physics Program at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Uh, he started that in two th 2016 and now has co-led and supported a variety of, uh, uh, of the campaigns there. Uh, modeling the experiments uh, with uh, very large multi-physics simulations. He's going to show you some of the outcomes of those simulations here. Um, and if there's anyone here, any students here that are involved in SIMPS, Chris is a graduate of SIMPS. SIMPS is the improv group here at Stanford. And uh, I would say that next to plasma physics, SIMPS was his second passion here at Stanford. So Chris, I'm going to turn yeah. it over to you. Cool. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. I have, I have a mic. Oh, have a mic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's always great to be back on campus. Uh, and I'm excited to share a bit of uh, context into the uh, really awesome uh, results that we've gotten recently at the National Ignition Facility. Uh, has anyone seen the uh, 60 Minutes episode that came out in January? Yeah, a little bit awesome or some of the the uh, news articles that, that came out uh, great if not that's okay i'll hopefully tell you all you need to know but um, provide some context around uh, what what was going on um, and i let's have to figure out where i'm standing here uh, we've gone through the introduction but just again my name is chris young uh, spent a whole lot of time here and uh, really really great to be back and i've been about uh, six and a half years at the lab uh, so just starting to really get a handle of of what's going on and in, in my job there so i'm uh, one person standing up here uh, representing the work of a cast of thousands many people have spent their whole careers decades working on the problem of fusion um, and this work is a collaboration between uh, industry, academia, and the national labs. And I'll give a special thanks to Dr. Nathan Mizan, who helped put this talk together with me. We actually gave a joint version of it uh, in this building upstairs a couple months ago. And he is another predecessor of mine through both Mark's lab and then into the Inertial Confinement Fusion Program. Uh, so an outline of the talk today. Um, give you a bit of a history of the fusion program at the lab and uh, a physics introduction to the uh, physics of ICF and what we're trying to do. Uh, talk a bit about the NIF facility itself. It's the world's largest, most energetic laser. And the targets we shoot are some of the most pristine, perfect materials that we can manufacture. Um, we'll go through the, the program as a whole and some major turning points. Um, which led to kind of the, the big breakthroughs that we've had recently and talk a bit about what we're doing next. So as I'm sure you're all aware, fusion uh, is what powers the stars. And if we can bring this power and harness that for energy production on Earth, that would really be a game-changing technology for humanity. 
Uh, if you're not familiar, fusion is the process of combining light elements into slightly heavier ones and releasing the binding energy of the nucleus in the process. That distinguishes it from fission, which is the splitting apart of large uh, atoms into mid-sized atoms. Uh, all of the elements are produced either directly via fusion or indirectly through supernova explosions in the universe. And all of the energy radiated towards Earth from the sun, sustaining life, uh, was originally produced through fusion. And there is a lot of naturally occurring deuterium in the seawater. So if we were able to collect that and harness, uh, release that energy through fusion reactions, uh, we're basically looking at a, a limitless source of energy. So, um, you know, the potential use of this is enormous for humanity. Uh, when we turn to uh, fusion research in particular, there's uh, many different approaches with lots of wide ranging applications. Uh, look, looking at the top left here, in, in terms of confining a hot fusion plasma, uh, you basically have three options. One, you have to be the size of a star and confine under your own gravity. Uh, since we're trying to do this in the laboratory, in a building, that's not going to work for us. So we have to either use uh, strong magnetic fields, which is like the ITER uh, machine that they're building in France, or a tokamak, if you've heard those types of uh, names. Uh, or you can use lasers to deliver a whole bunch of energy and squish this fusion fuel under its own inertia. And that's called inertial confinement. And that's what we do at Livermore. Uh, over here is a few different types of the, the inertial confinement fusion architectures. You can hit the fuel directly with the laser. We call that direct drive. Uh, we can put the fuel inside of an X-ray oven called a Holrom. We'll be talking a lot about that today, and we call that indirect drive. That's mainly what we do at Livermore. Uh, and you can also use a magnetic fuel to basically have store a bunch of energy at capacitors and dump it down a wire really fast and uh, what's called a Z-pinch configuration, and you can confine a cylindrical uh, plasma that way. And there's, of course, many applications for this work. Uh, in clean energy research to fundamental science, studying the universe, the interiors of stars, basically materials at very extreme temp uh, densities, temperatures, and pressures, uh, and the conditions that occur in nuclear weapons explosions, which is why we, the defense lab, uh, are also involved in this work. So to give you a bit of history as to how we got here, uh, the quest for inertial fusion ignition has been a 60-year journey. And it really uh, started, the idea for ICF uh, is as old as the idea of the laser itself. And very soon after the laser was invented, people realized that this could be a mechanism of delivering a lot of energy into a small volume to initiate fusion reactions. And there was a seminal paper by John Knuckles, one of our uh, early lab directors, um, which was kind of outlined this uh, process in the open literature for the first time. And since that time, NIF has been home to an array of ever-increasing lasers in size and scale and energy, uh, culminating with the National Ignition Facility uh, 1.9 megajoule uh, laser, uh, which is the largest, most energetic laser in the world right now. Um, and you'll notice that NIF came around right around uh, and kind of the, the concept of NIF in the, in the beginnings can be traced right around the same time when we stopped uh, underground nuclear testing and switched as a nation to the kind of science-based stockpile stewardship model for ensuring the safety and security of our nuclear stockpile. And NIF is a, uh, one of the only facilities in the world able to make these uh, super high energy density states. It plays a very important role in that. And so there was this study by the National Academy of Sciences in uh, the 1990 timeframe that said you know, we need to achieve fusion ignition and go after uh, you know, very high gains, uh, right? We're going to come back to the concept of gain. That's just the uh, fusion energy liberated through the process compared to the energy that we had to invest uh, to initiate those reactions. So a gain of one is energy break even. And we would like to be operating somewhere around, you know, gain of 100 if you were going to, say, build a power plant based on this technology. 
Um, we've spent a whole lot of time trying to pass game of one for right now. Um, but rather than go after that gain of 100 huge facility first in the 90s, it made more sense to take a smaller step and go after a, a small to mid-sized gains of 2 to 10. So that was built into the idea of NIF. Uh, demonstrating ignition should be our highest priority. And it took a little bit longer than we were hoping, but as of December of last year, we've finally gotten there. Um, and another point is that you know, the only possible technology in the 90s when this was being conceived that we could uh, kind of set up at scale at that time uh, was to use a glass laser. So if we were going to rebuild NIF today, there are many more uh, efficient laser architectures that we could use. But at the time, it was uh, amplified neodymium glass lasers. Uh, and we could take advantage of all the existing experience in infrastructure uh, at Livermore. So that was the natural place to site this facility. Um, and they recommended that we recognize ICF primarily as a defense program, not as an energy program, again, for the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, so the rough timeline is, you know, 1990, we have the idea we need to build NIF. In 93, we got the commitment from the Department of Energy to build it. We broke ground in 97. We commissioned the laser with the first experiments in 2009. And really in 2011 is when we first introduced the deuterium and tritium fusion fuel and started trying to make neutrons. So we've had a robust program over the last 12 years. So I've said the words inertial confinement fusion a lot now. So what are we actually doing? Uh, the main idea is that we're going to implode a sphere. And that lets you take... Uh, you know, something and increase its density and pressure many, many times over to reach the very extreme temperatures, density and pressure that we need in order to initiate fusion reactions. And here's the title of that uh, seminal paper in Nature in 1972 that laid this out. And actually, George Zimmerman is still working at the lab. He's still developing the code that he started uh, way back then to model these systems. and. Uh, he's, you know, remains an amazing contributor. Um, I kind of mentioned this before, but the direct drive concept, uh, we're just going to put the fuel inside this shell. Uh, we call it the ablator because its main purpose is to absorb that laser energy and just blow up. And you get an equal and opposite reaction inward that's going to compress that fuel as it travels in. Uh, you can think of it like a spherical rocket where the rocket exhaust is pointed outwards and you know, the rocket's traveling in towards the origin. Um, but as you can imagine with direct drive, if, uh, say you're taking a water balloon and you're trying to squeeze it in between your fingers and you're trying to keep it exactly spherical, uh, what's going to happen? Right? You're going to get some bumps. It's going to squeeze out in between all the parts where you can't exactly uh, balance everything. And there's a lot of uh, laser plasma interactions going on around this that is preventing you from getting that laser light exactly where you need it to balance it perfectly. So uh, it turns out that maintaining your spherical symmetry is pretty challenging in direct drive. Uh, but we do have a facility, the University of Rochester, uh, the Laboratory for Laser Energetics, or LLE, uh, has a smaller laser that uh, studies this extensively. But at Livermore, we go more with the indirect drive approach, and that adds this HORAM, or a radiation cavity. It's a German word. Uh, you can think of it just as an X-ray oven, whose job is to take that laser light coming in uh, and, and make a bath of x-rays. And because ovens are very good at redistributing the heat in a nice even way, it's much easier to push on this thing uh, you know, evenly from all directions and maintain a spherical implosion. Uh, so we usually use cylindrical HOROMs here. We have two holes on the top and bottom, uh, which are pretty stupidly named the laser entrance holes, or LEHs. Um, X-rays bounce around in here. Again, with the capsule, we have our deuterium tritium fuel. Uh, in this particular scheme, we'll have uh, gas in the middle and a shell of uh, cryogenically frozen DT ice. And the goal is to get that thing going at about 400 kilometers per second to give it the kinetic energy it needs to spark and kind of start off the fusion reactions. 
when this thing implodes to about 30 or 40 times smaller in radius than it started. Um, and that's exactly what's illustrated here. So we illuminate this with x-rays, the ablator blows up, we get that equal and opposite force inward, it accelerates, it decelerates. Uh, when it stops, we call that stagnation, and that's kind of when the fusion burn starts happening. Uh, and then the name of the game is try to keep it there cooking as long as possible before it's going to blow up and dissipate all that energy, and then we stop making fusion reactions. And so the picture right when we're burning is we're trying to go for a hot spot that's formed from the DT gas. That's kind of lower energy, or sorry, lower uh, density, but very high temperature. 5 keV is, you know, a few million degrees Celsius. On the robustly burning ones, we might be five times the temperature of the sun uh, when the fusion reactions are going. And then that's going to be surrounded by the shell of colder DT that's been compressed up to about a kilogram per centimeter cubed of density. All right, so there are tons of physics challenges. This is why it's a you know, very hard problem, but also a very rewarding physics problem to work on. We have to bring together these big multidisciplinary teams of people with expertise uh, kind of all over the map. So on the Holram side, and this is where I live most of the, the day, you know, we're worried about uh, how we couple the, the laser energy into the system and use that energy efficiently. Um, and, uh, and also the, the Horam dynamics kind of determine how well we can press on this capsule uh, symmetrically throughout the whole implosion. Uh, on the capsule side, there's a lot of uh, hydrodynamic stability uh, that you have to worry about. These are classically Rayleigh-Taylor unstable systems uh, as you have shocks and uh, accelerating, decelerating interfaces of different density kind of all mixing together. Um, and then, as I was mentioning, you know, trying to figure out that you know, we want to add as much energy as we can and we want to minimize all the losses as much as possible to uh, get the favorable energy balance and lots of fusion reactions. So to achieve ignition, really extreme conditions are required. And this puts some numbers to that. I kind of mentioned this already. We use deuterium tritium because uh, that is the easiest fusion reaction uh, to, to conduct. It has the highest cross-section for a given temperature. Uh, the goal here is, or and the, the product of that is a, a fast neutron that basically goes out and leaves the system and this slower alpha particle or a helium nucleus. And the name of the game is trying to get enough stuff there to stop those alpha particles and get them to redeposit their energy uh, in the hot spot, thereby continuing to add heat and heating everything up more. And we have this nice feedback where the cross-section for DT actually goes up as it gets hotter. So as you get hotter, you, it's easier to uh, fuse more fuel and so on. Um, and, but it takes really, really high densities, uh, like 100 grams per centimeter cubed peak central density, really high pressures, 400 gigabar, like we're talking interior of planets type uh, pressures. Uh, Mark mentioned I was going to show you a, a simulation, right? These experiments are very uh, expensive. We don't have many opportunities to take them on the facility, so we do quite a lot of modeling work with large multi-physics simulations that run on the supercomputers at Livermore. Uh, and we can model all parts of this, the radiation transport of the lasers coming in, the response of the Horam materials blowing up, the x-rays uh, kind of making this rocket uh, effect happen, and then all the nuclear reactions and, and things that happen on the, on the inside of the capsule. Uh, this is a bit of an older design with a longer pulse, but it kind of you know, illustrates the point. We put in a little bit of energy in the beginning, and that kind of uh, launches some shock waves and, and sets up the implosion the way we want it. And uh, later on in time, we come along with this uh, kind of the full power of the laser really hit it. And that's when the radius really starts to go down and compress very quickly. And you can see here the time scale we're talking about is you know, 10, 20 nanoseconds, the billi uh, billionths of a second. 
So very, very short time, and, and the, the fusion reactions are cooking in there for about uh, 100 picoseconds, so very, very fast. <clears throat> As you can imagine, uh, energy is lost kind of in many different ways along the way. We start with a two megajoule laser, uh, and it would be great if we could get all that energy into, you know, directly uh, helping to start those fusion reactions, but... This is uh, kind of the reality of what we have to deal with. Uh, some of that energy gets just scattered right back out of the whole realm. Uh, it goes into producing hot electrons and low density plasma, kind of this, uh, you know, as we see from the simulation of how stuff is gonna come in and, and the, the wall's gonna blow up and start filling the whole realm and block the laser beams. Um, so, but the majority of that energy goes into x-rays and a lot of that has to go to heating the whole realm walls, right? It's getting the oven hot enough uh, so that it can cook our capsule. And some of those x-rays are gonna escape through those holes, which we need to let the lasers in. Uh, and unfortunately they also work as, uh, they work against us in that way. Uh, so of the two megajoules that come in, we get about 150 to 250 kilojoules. Uh, onto the capsule. A lot of that goes into uh, ablating those outer layers and only maybe 10 or 15 kilojoules actually gets converted into kinetic energy of that DT shell that's going to start moving inward and do the compressive work on the fusion fuel on the inside. And we would love to convert all of that into the internal energy of the fuel, except as I was mentioning with the the you know, asymmetry, keeping it spherical is really hard. Uh, so if we don't push exactly the same on all sides and we squish it a little bit you know, like a pancake or a little bit like a sausage, those are the words we use, uh, that residual kinetic energy is gonna rob your hotspot. So that's that arrow. Uh, and then finally, you have some hotspot and in internal energy. You're gonna make some fusion reactions. Uh, now it's a, a competition between everything that's uh, gonna uh, the things that are adding energy to the system, which is the fusion reactions and the alpha particles that you're able to stop. And that's in competition with all the loss mechanisms, uh, radiation, conduction, and the mechanical work of this thing is going to start expanding and it's gonna cool when it starts expanding. Um, so after all that energy flow, we're gonna get some amount of energy back out through the fusion reactions. And for a long time, this number was a lot less than two megajoules. But in August of 2021, we had our first you know, very near ignition shot. 1.3 megajoules came back. Uh, we were very excited to see that. And then in December of last year, we hit 3.1, which was for the first time you know, a net energy gain uh, compared to those two megajoules of laser energy that we put in. Now, it's not quite that easy because 320 megajoules came out of the grid to charge the capacitors that we need to run the laser. So from a power plant perspective, three is still less than 320. But NIF is not meant to be a fusion reactor. It was meant to be the demonstration technology kind of that there's no fundamental physical process that is impeding this from working. And now there's actually several uh, startup companies out there that are pursuing uh, different types of, of architectures, some in the inertial confinement fusion space, trying to get this number up and make that, uh, yeah, make, make that math work for power production. And because we have all these uh, different energy exchanges, and just noting that there are many different kind of efficiencies or gains that you can uh, describe. And so don't get confused if you hear people talk about, well, I got more energy out of the capsule than I put into it, or I got more energy out of the fuel than I put into it. Um, but, you know, we passed gain of one on these much earlier than we did on, on the full target. All right, so now I'll talk a bit about the facility itself. Um, Primarily, their primary experimental facility for doing ICF is at Lawrence Livermore. It's in a very large building. It's about the size of three football fields. And 
Uh, as I mentioned, 320 megajoules of electrical energy from the grid get converted to 1.9 megajoules of UV light. And at the end, on one side there, there's this nice uh, 10 meter diameter target chamber that's under vacuum. And so all those 192 beams that uh, you know, all are, are through this part of the facility all kind of come up and plug in on, on all sides. And there's some really cool movies on YouTube you can check out of like how this works. Um, <clears throat> sitting in the very middle of this on a little arm is our whole ROM. And it needs a whole bunch of hardware to keep it cold. I mentioned it's cryogenically uh, frozen DT ice on the inside there. So that starts at 18 Kelvin and uh, takes a whole lot of you know, thermal management to grow a nice ice layer and keep it all uniform. And so that's about one centimeter large. And then on the, in the inside of this thing, the, the shell of material that's actually holding the fusion fuel is only about two millimeters in diameter. So crazy uh, span of, of length scales here, right? It takes this giant facility to deliver that energy into basically this, something the size of a peppercorn. Uh, the, each laser beam travels about one and a half kilometers through the facility and it gets uh, amplified through flash lamp pumped amplifiers four times before it gets diverted into the target chamber. And so there's that picture of all the beams kind of coming in and we have a bunch of diagnostics and looks really cool. It looks so cool that they filmed part of a Star Trek movie in there and called it the, the reactor core or something. Uh, here's when the target chamber was installed in 1999. I think a bunch of people came on site on Saturday to come see it uh, and it weighed a, a whole lot. A bit more on the Horam. It's about one centimeter long and six millimeters in diameter, and we cool it to about 18 Kelvin before our really high performance shots. Uh, here it is in the, the cryo shroud here uh, that's kind of keeping everything cold. And then, you know, in the last minute before the shot, it just kind of opens and then we go really fast. Uh, we need heaters. Uh, there's some windows in here so that we can get x-rays out to our diagnostics to see what's going on. Um, and we need all these dimpled shields here to uh, keep the laser safe because uh, we have the world's largest laser. If that reflects off something in the chamber and goes back up a different laser beam uh, or laser pathway, that's going to be really bad news. So we spend a whole lot of time making sure each shot, shot is safe for the laser. Uh, the capsule itself, it's going to sit uh, basically in between two pieces of saran wrap, but it's very, very thin. It's about 20 nanometers. Uh, we call that the support tent. It's... Uh, holding the capsule in the middle there. We make this out of CVD diamond or uh, CH plastic, or some are beryllium, but uh, mostly what we do right now is diamond. Uh, here's to scale what it looks like to start at two millimeters and compress down you know, 30 or 40 times. And basically this X-ray emitting part in the middle of the hotspot is uh, something less than the diameter of the human hair. It's, it's around 100 microns. Um, we need to get the fusion fuel in here somehow, and we've used a series of continually uh, decreasing fill tube sizes. So this guy right here is five microns. I think it used to be 20 and then 10 and five, and now we can do two sometimes, although those break a lot more often. Um, but just incredible engineering uh, to you know, laser drill this five micron hole and get a, a, a tube in there to fill it with the, the DT. But all of these engineering features kind of, we, we can't get away from them. We have to engineer around them and these all uh, provide some issues for us later uh, in, in disrupting the, the perfect 1D spherical implosion that we're going after. Uh, here's a picture inside the target chamber. The uh, whole ROM is inside this white circle, and we have some other uh, diagnostic arms there. 
uh, around it, and what happens after the shot. I think on the ignition one, we burned it you know, way back here, and that was the, the first time uh, we'd done that. Uh, one slide on diagnostics. Uh, this is a huge area of research and amazing engineering, but they've provided really key insight into our experiments. As you can imagine, it's very hard to make any progress if you cannot see what you are doing and see what happened. Uh, so we have things like uh, X-ray cameras and neutron cameras, uh, in some case time resolved, so we can get a bit of a movie as to uh, what's happening, and we have different platforms uh, that look at different parts of the implosion so we can make sure we're doing what we're intending to early on all the way to the, the full-up integrated test. Uh, we can look at gammas uh, and different uh, self-emission and backlit radiography. All right, so here's one slide. You all have my job for a second. You are the ICF designer. What kind of parameters do you think you can vary in your next experiment here in the whole ROM and, and the capsule? Just throw it out there. Dimensions. Dimensions, yes. Although your, la your laser is staying the same size, so you don't have a lot of play in how big you can make it. Materials on the outside. Materials of all these components, yeah. The, particular uh, way you you uh, put the the diamond on here or what material you make the whole arm out of uh, any other guesses thoughts no wrong answer all right point is there's a lot uh, on the whole arm side everything about the laser where you point these beams what particular pulse shape you put on it the wavelength of the laser, uh, as we mentioned, all the materials and their, their uh, dimensions. There's a, a whole bunch of kind of derived metrics. We call these like the rocket quantities about how fast you're going to go, uh, the different growth factors leading to uh, what your hydrodynamic stability uh, is going to be. Um, so this is a huge, huge parameter space. And as I'll show you, very few experimental opportunities to test these things. So we really have to, to use codes and simulations and theory and try to put it all together to, to make progress uh, without testing every idea on the facility. So now I'm going to do a, a little bit of a time series here to identify major turning points in the program that kind of led to the most recent results. And we're going to plot this as thermonuclear yield versus year on the facility. Each one of these is a particular experiment. So in 2011, when we started the DT experiments, uh, we were using plastic capsules. Uh, we had a fantastic design that everyone had been uh, working on for years just on paper and in one-dimensional and two-dimensional codes. And turns out three-dimensional reality was a bit different, and there were some other things we hadn't thought of and weren't modeling uh, taking into account. And so uh, by 2013, though, by changing the design we call low foot to high foot, we demonstrated alpha heating in the capsule for the first time. And really the, the you know, gain from these early years was we were figuring out how this was working, and we were... Uh, developing all the experimental platforms we needed to, again, see what we were doing and, and get the diagnostic suite all set up. And so uh, just kind of getting all these uh, you know, gamma spectroscopy, X-ray emission of the core uh, going. But at the end of this era, we're still a factor of a thousand away from fusion ignition where we need to be. In 2013, the laser pulse shape was changed to help mitigate some of the hydrodynamic instabilities. And we go from something that looks like this. Remember, we're trying to keep this a smooth sphere uh, coming in evenly from all sides to something more like this that had much fewer hydrodynamic instabilities. Uh, also going to a shorter pulse, that helps it be uh, less unstable and it also helps just kind of get everything 
done quicker before the whole ROM has a lot of time to fill up with plasma and start blocking the laser beams and stuff. Um, and these are three-dimensional simulations in the, the code Hydra that we run. And actually, so these features right here, this X, uh, those are the uh, impact of the capsule support tent, that saran wrap that's holding the capsule where it touches, uh, kind of launches these jets. And then also this is the fill tube here, which kind of on every experiment, like, oh, yep, there's the fill tube jet. It, we can't get away from it. Um, we then moved to Diamond, um, and this really helped. Uh, well, we were able to use a lower Horam gas pressure, which cut down on a lot of the laser plasma interactions that were happening in the Horam, and, and that helped uh, things get a lot more uh, repeatable and able to be modeled well in the codes. Uh, this also improved our symmetry control with the shorter laser pulse, again, kind of getting everything done before the whole ROM shuts down. Uh, in 2017, we, again, first demonstrated alpha heating with Diamond. Um, <clears throat> and I've mostly said all this already, but uh, yeah, again, using all of our different diagnostics to uh, be able to check that we are remaining round at all times throughout the implosion. Uh, and that was you know, a, a key advance in this period. Uh, so then we made the shells bigger. And that might seem like an obvious thing to do, but again, the size of our laser is not getting bigger with us. So that means learning to be more efficient and getting finer and finer engineering control kind of over all aspects of the process. Um, and so we increase the capsule size relative to the whole ROM. So we're using our energy more e efficiency. Implosion symmetry gets harder now, uh, but we were able to uh, build in some new tricks to maintain that. And by 2020, we achieved the burning plasma state. And so uh, physically, it's starting to be a different regime. Uh, it's where you're starting to make enough alpha particles that the, the heat and energy from the alpha particle deposition is starting to change uh, what's going on. And so in the analogy of say, trying to you know, light a wood fire, right? You're providing a spark for a long time, spark went away, nothing happened. Uh, here in the burning plasma regime, you're, you're catching a little bit of the fuel and you're, you're getting enough heat back kind of about equal to uh, the amount of energy you're putting into it um, in, in terms of just the sparks. That would be like the kinetic energy of that shell in, in the, the big, long uh, flow chart of energy that we were talking about. Anyway, it's the, the sign that you know, something is fundamentally about to change, and we're getting very close to that cliff where uh, ignition is going to really take it off and the, the thermal instability is going to kick in. And so how do we do that? Uh, we scaled up the capsule more than the whole ROM, so that makes it more efficient. Uh, but we had to improve our control over symmetry. And so one thing that we use uh, a lot now is called cross-beam energy transfer. So you can take advantage of a particular laser uh, matter interaction where by changing the laser wavelength subtly, um, like an angstrom or uh, less, you can kind of pass energy between laser beams using the plasma as a mediator. And that kind of helps you uh, take energy away from, from certain parts of the whole ROM and put it, say, uh, in, in other parts of the whole ROM where, where you want it. And getting uh, good engineering control over that was really important. Uh, and also, from our target fabrication side, you know, Throughout this whole process, every year, the quality of the targets are getting better. The, the number of defects are, are going down with time. Um, and that definitely helps things. So finally, in uh, right August of 2021, I kind of mentioned this before, uh, we had this guy right here, the uh, gain 0.7 and loss in greater than one. So there's something in fusion called the Lawson criteria. It basically says you need to get something hot enough and dense enough for a long enough period of time in order to get a fusion ignition. 
it's pretty easy to get two out of the three of those things. It's very hard to get all three at the same time and keep this plasma confined that just wants to you know, blow itself up. So we, we got to a, a part where uh, you know, we had so much alpha, dep alpha production and fusion reactions that we exceeded Lawson's criteria for the first time. That was the first time any experimental facility in any type of fusion configuration achieved that. Uh, but in terms of the gain and that National Academy's report definition of ignition, which said gain one, uh, we still hadn't surpassed that milestone yet. And we did a few repeats. Uh, actually, this is probably the most repeated uh, experiment that we've ever done, trying to do exactly the same thing. Uh, and you can see they all fell short, kind of illustrating the extreme sensitivity right at the beginning of the yield cliff where any little thing can kind of drag you back down and that competition between the energy gains and losses, the losses win. Um, but how did we get to the threshold of ignition and the, the loss in greater than one shot? Well, we made these holes smaller. Again, that might sound like a really obvious thing. Hey, you're losing energy out these holes. How about you plug them up a little bit? But again, we need to be able to get the lasers inside and uh, symmetry control, uh, basically by restricting where you can point the laser beam all gets really hard when you do that. Uh, we also changed the laser pulse to uh, not push quite as hard, but push longer. And experimentally, the uh, system really seemed to uh, respond well to that. And that uh, August shot had the most pristine capsule uh, with the fewest defects fielded to date, and we have not actually been able to recreate a capsule that pristine uh, again. So it was really a unique and exciting time. And then what happened? We upgraded the laser a bit. We had 1.9 megajoules to play with, and then we got to 2.05 just for these couple shots. And doing so allowed for slightly thicker capsules to be used. And if you can go thicker, that provides a little bit more margin and robustness to all these little defects in the fill tube and the tent and everything that's trying to kind of rip this apart as you are imploding it at 400 kilometers per second. And so here in December, for the first time, we surpassed the amount of laser energy that we put in and got gain 1.5. And again, uh, with a capsule that was not quite as good as that other one. And so the fact that we were still able to do that means, all right, we're in getting better uh, in, a, in a more robust regime. And as I mentioned, the, the things that enabled that, we got a little bit more laser energy, we thickened the capsule, we continued on this track of pushing longer, not necessarily harder, and uh, keeping everything round. And in, in doing so, we, we finally surpassed the ignition threshold. So what are we doing right now? Um, our current campaigns are trying to improve performance and robustness. And you know, it's kind of a funny business to get in. You know, we've spent decades and decades and decades trying to just get ignition. We're kind of single-mindedly focusing on this goal. And you do that, and the next day, the goalpost just moves down. It's like, great, you got one, give me 10. <laughs> so 10 megajoules is kind of the next uh, level that, that we're aiming for. Um, we're going to continue optimizing around the, the design that gave us ignition, playing with those rocket parameters like the velocity and the, the different thicknesses and the laser pulse. Uh, we have campaigns further increasing efficiency, right? We have a playbook that kind of worked. How far can we push this? So this is one of my campaigns this year, uh, just trying to make the cylinder and the laser entrance holes smaller and deal with the symmetry uh, challenges that come with that. Uh, we have some different uh, ideas about how to increase compression, right? You can increase the, the confining material around the hotspot by shocking it up to even higher and higher uh, densities, uh, but there's trade-offs associated with that. And we also have some different ORAM geometries, like uh, this guy called the Frustrum, uh, which can use less surface area, so be, be more efficient uh, again, trading off with other challenges like symmetry. 
So to summarize, the outlook for fusion research is bright right now. Um, it took longer to reach fusion ignition on NIF than we originally envisioned in 1990, but we can say now we've kind of attained the, the original uh, goal for both the performance and then now all of the scientific inquiry that can follow. Um, again, NIF is not a fusion reactor. We're not going to plug it into the grid and start producing power, but by attaining this ignition and, and demon demonstrating this, you know, we've kind of shown that there's nothing physically that's fundamentally holding us back from going to higher and higher gains. The physics works. It's, it's going to turn more into an engineering uh, type of problem to, to get a, a fusion reactor going. And many startup companies are trying to do exactly that. Um, hope I was able to show you that, you know, there wasn't one eureka moment that just kind of suddenly everything worked, right? It was a very long slog uh, performance made in incremental steps, continually improving all parts of the process, uh, continuing to improve our diagnostics um, and engineering control and our simulation capabilities, getting uh, larger and larger computers, being able to go from 2D to more routine 3D simulations, things like that. Um, so far, we have not been able to repeat the, uh, the ignition experiment. We actually haven't had a, uh, a, a real attempt at it yet, but in May um, next month, we'll hopefully uh, get a second one on the board and start assessing how, what the variability and, and robustness is in this new regime. And as I mentioned, we have several new campaigns that are continuing to try to push forward and, and get to the 10 megajoule limit. The next few years, uh, NIF will be upgraded either in power and energy, and that should enable uh, you know, quite a bit more more work and more margin uh, to to continue improving this. So, with that, I will say we are hiring. If this sounds exciting to you, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. And there's, you know, besides just fusion, uh, Livermore is an amazing place to work with a, a whole bunch of uh, very, very smart people across all different fields. Uh, so, highly recommended. But thank Great. you for inviting Thanks me. And for I'll take any such questions. an exciting and spellbinding uh, story that you shared with us today. Thank you so much. But we now have time for uh, if everybody can clap. Would be great. Yeah. So it looks like we have time maybe for two or three questions in the room before we break into the small student question. Any questions from students or others? We have some technical experts up here in the front. Anybody want to uh, see a hand back there? I was just wondering what your budget is. <laughs> you want to take that one? You want to take yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but it's public. It's a line item on the congressional budget every year, so you, you can look it up. It's big. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably in the 100 million range, but that's spread a, a, among a, a whole lot of different pieces. So. Um, Who's going to give you a microphone for the people watching online? Okay. Hello? Is this working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just curious. I know you said that this is still like initial phases and you guys are not trying to build a power generator or anything, but with that experimental setup, is there any mechanism to introduce like more fuel into the reaction, or are you constrained by whatever fits into the initial uh, package? Right. Yeah. It, it's basically the size of the laser driver is going to set kind of the size of your target and how much fuel. So we we can still go a little bit bigger, um, and the trade-off there is with more fuel and or like a larger size, we won't be able to push it as fast. So then you're getting into all those engineering trade-offs with kind of the rocket equation stuff that, you know, great, we might have more fuel to burn, but if you give it a smaller spark, it won't, uh, it might not take off and you won't hit that ignition threshold. Uh, we got one in the back. Um, sounds like you spend a lot of time um, trying to maintain that symmetry. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes symmetries introduce instabilities, which I think is what you saw on the direct um, 
no, configuration. Direct. And so I was wondering, has anyone ever considered um, introducing some asymmetry to the problem, which um, can, can uh, I guess, cause more predict uh, can result in more predictability? Um, sometimes that sort of technique is used in different physics problems. Right. Um, and yeah, because of the predictability, you might be able to increase your yield because you'll better understand the result. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, there are, there are a few uh, papers on that topic. Um, you know, one idea is to compensate for known asymmetries in the drive. So like if you know you're going to end up squishing this way, you can start with a uh, as aspherical capsule to start to start with. So basically it'll compensate out. Um, also, yes, exactly. There's, uh, you know, we can kind of induce whatever asymmetric uh, trajectory we want by how we partition the, the laser energy in the different beams. Um, so far, the majority of the implosions really have been focused on trying to stay uh, round kind of throughout the, the whole, uh, whole implosion, but I think there's, there's some interesting things to look at in that space, yeah. So <clears throat> presumably you you have um, um, well you have this huge simulation capability um, and you also have all the observational capability. Um, you didn't show any comparisons of the of the the shapes of things with the simulations and uh, and so on. But yep. I'm sure you, I'm sure you're doing sure. them. And so my real question is uh, with this, a parameter space as big as you have. Uh, obviously, the simulation side is going to be the way you explore portions of that. Are you comfortable enough that you, that simulation capability is is good enough that that you really can optimize the exploration with a small number of shots, or is there more to do on the simulation side? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole chunk of our program devoted to just improving predictive capability of the whole realm. I mean, that's really where uh, a lot of the the challenge comes in. Um, the, I'd say right now we're kind of in a hybrid mode where the simulations are good at certain things, especially early time before the whole ROM fills up with plasma and you really start getting these complicated uh, laser matter interactions. Uh, and then for the later part in time, we have different analytical or semi-empirical models Kind of informed by our previous experiments, say if, since you mentioned shape, like that's that's a huge one. We spend, uh, you know, for every high yield DT experiment that we go for, there's usually at least one or two symmetry tuning experiments to make sure it's round in in those conditions, um, and, and that is something that we as the continual battle to kind of uh, massage the code into agreement with with that. Um, Last question over there. If you don't mind, I'll put you in an awkward spot. You did a nice overview of laser confinement, magnetic confinement, etc. Mm -hmm. If somebody was going to work, wanted to work on or invest in the most likely first to produce commercial power, right? I'll ask you to, although I know you're coming from the Laser the side. Side. Yep. What's what what's on track to get there? Right. Um, our lab director answered this question at the uh, DOE panel af after the the press conference. But it, yeah, magnetic fusion has had much more investment into the engineering side and uh, turning it into a practical reactor than ICF has. Um, However, we haven't demonstrated a burning plasma or fusion ignition conditions in a magnetic uh, device yet. So on the inertial side, we have, I'd say, some catching up to do on, on the technology required to actually put this into a uh, power producing configuration. I'm not sure right now which one will get there first, um, but kind of, uh, you know, we, we should invest in all of them. And uh, sort of it in thank you one last time. There is this kind of it, it, to me, it's interesting that as you mentioned, a lot of companies 
startups are trying to actually do this right now. So there may be some evidence there. I can also say as a long time uh, observer and admirer of the Office of Science and DOE, there's probably a lot of technology that you're doing that is attracting commercial interest. Do you find that to be the case? Pieces of this, different kinds of reactions and materials and geometries and whatnot that could be used in totally different ways than you're using them here? Uh, right, I mean, there, just in the past two years, uh, there's been an incredible infusion of private money into to startups. You, know, you plot that versus time, it's like yeah. taking off. But you know, to that point, like there are many uh, common problems between the different schemes, uh, like the first wall of the reactor in a, in a magnetic um, configuration. If somebody solves that, that's gonna kind of help all the other schemes uh, in, in sharing, yeah. sharing technology like that. That said, we're out of time, and thanks again for uh, sharing this amazing story with us. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you for having me.